Yeah. Uh-uh. <laughs> 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 Put out your smoke suit from smoking. Everybody take a deep breath. Get ready. Exhale. Today we're going to talk about... Hey, how you been the past few weeks, anyway? It's been a really full few weeks, hasn't it? Uh-huh. You know what's far out? I was here on the first day of the workshop, you know, and I looked around and see everybody's face. Everybody looks totally different after three weeks of this stuff. Going into the fourth week. <laughs> you look good. <laughs> That's a lot of time. Making some good music? A lot of trying. Yeah. Feels good. Well, we're going to do some, uh, we're going to talk about what's coming up in the next couple of years in the future of uh, audio. And uh, I do that, nobody can see the blackboard on this. Right on the door. Right on the door. I'll do that. Yeah, thanks, Put it over here just to surprise anybody with trucks. Yeah. Now, can you see the blackboard over there? Okay. Hey, we'll put the wave button next before we start here. Or did I just start it? Oh, we already started. You're kidding. No, we started. No, it's been through the studio yet. Oh, fine. How you been? <laughs> ah, it's so warm. No, I explained. They already know, but in case you missed it, the air conditioning in here is not working. It's frozen up, so it's turned off right now until it falls out. So I'll just pretend you're in a sauna and get $10 an hour or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Is that hard here? No. Jim, you're just too hot. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's still working a lot more hard. Is the, um, let's see, I'm going to put this here. The team does, the team that's in D is still back, I believe. Uh, team one? Yeah. Two, yeah. Three, yeah. Four, yeah. Five, yeah. Six, yeah. seven, yeah. eight, yeah. nine, yeah. partially, yeah. ten, yeah. Eleven, yeah. twelve, yeah. Eight is here. Eight. You guys are back in B, were you? Yeah. Okay, fine. No, how was the weekend? <laughs> Your last weekend, I sell coffee and we were not excited about it. Yeah. Sunday was kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not a list here. There's not a list, but I'm going to get paid. Most schedule mix time on Friday. Those need right to the airport and include your flight departure time. And in case you're going to be driving through Columbus and you can give somebody a lift. Put your name on this list here, okay? Other than that, just keep in mind tomorrow we're going back to our mixed down schedule. So uh, be aware that their start tomorrow morning is 8. And we have a seminar starting at 9 o'clock in Studio A. And seminars in the evening, and you've got to bring your game with you for the mixed list. Here. And keep in mind, sort of like have an idea what their best mix so far. Play that. And uh, a mighty round of applause for all the students who helped me move yesterday. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay, any other business or any other problems? What? We we did run out, did we? We had a few times left. We ran out of lots of jokes. Any problems or anything? We're all clear tomorrow's schedule. Okay. Boys we'll started on the future trends and recording. Five. <laughs> well, everybody says digital is just around the corner. Digital is just around the corner. You work with the digital machine here? I'm yeah. working with the digital machine here. Hey, well, you know, that's a videotape recorder, right? And uh, it's the kind of videotape recorder that you have at home. Digital video cassette recorder. And then there's a little unit. It goes with it called a PCM, right? PCM. What does PCM stand for? False code modulation. Okay. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what digital is. Okay, so everybody has a real clear understanding of what digital is. Have you ever gone over this? No. Okay, well, I want you, what I want you to do at the end of today, or even 
in the middle is to have a, a really clear understanding of what digital means and what digital recording is. Nelson, look in here. Thank you. Um, so we're going to discuss what the difference between digital and analog is and what they both mean. And then we're going to talk about what the process of digital encoding is. And uh, then we'll go over how digital recording works and what its characteristics are. And then we'll have questions on that. And if that's all clear, then we'll go on to other things like uh, digital delay and maybe uh, enhancers and synthesizers and stuff like that. Depends on how much time we have. But I think digital, just digital theory is the basic thing everybody should understand. Uh, so if you walk into a studio or on a stage or something with digital equipment there, you know how to operate, you know what's happening, you know how it works. Uh, let me just try and explain what the concept of digital is. There's two types of signals that we're talking about. One is analog and one is digital. Now, analog means a signal that is continuously flowing and changing and that you can measure in a continuous flowing, changing manner. Okay, so it's a, it's a signal which is continuously flowing and changing, and you can measure it in the same way. You can measure it in a flowing, changing way to any degree of accuracy necessary. You can measure it to any degree of accuracy necessary. First, we'll just give these definitions, then we'll discuss what they mean. A digital signal is an incremental signal conveyed in certain distinct units called bits. And you can only measure the accuracy of such a signal to the nearest bit. You can only measure the accuracy of a digital signal to the nearest bit. How many people here have a digital watch? Anybody here got a digital watch? One person got a digital watch. How did I bring a digital watch? You got his Darth Vader on the watch. No, no, you got a digital watch. Digital watch has little numbers that change, right? You know what it says? 543. And then it says 544, right? Now, some of them read seconds and some of them don't. But let's say you have one that doesn't read seconds. Even one does, the same principle applies. Yeah, it says 543, and then in between 543 and 544, you don't know where you are, right? Until the next digit flips up. <coughs> or if it's 543 and 52 seconds, then it goes 53 seconds, right? But you don't know when the half a second is or tenth of a second. In other words, you can only tell on a digital watch when the next increment comes up, right? But if you imagine, you have to imagine, because there's nothing, not one here, an electric clock on the wall, right, with a sweep second hand. That sweep second hand moves smoothly around the circle, and you can actually pinpoint fractions of a second, right? You could stop that hand at any point and measure the exact time, right? So an electric clock like hanging on the wall would be an analog device because the hand moves with a continuous flow and you can measure down to any degree of accuracy that you can. I mean, you can measure exactly where the tip of that hand is, right? But a digital watch or digital clock only flashes numerals and you can't tell where you are between the numerals. So it only gives you distinct increments, which can be minutes or seconds or whatever fine you want to go. Is that distinction clear? Okay, let's use another analogy. You have a jar and the jar holds a quart of water, right? The jar holds a quart of water. You pour the water in the jar and then you pour it out into a measuring cup and you measure that you've got four cups of water, right? Four cups of water makes a quart. Now, you could measure any amount of water you want in that jar. You could put in 16.3267 ounces of water, right? You can measure it out exactly in a graduated cylinder or something. You can measure any amount of water into that jar. That's analog measurement of volume. Now, let's say we take that same jar, we empty all the water out, and we put marbles in. Okay. Now let's say the jar holds 144 marbles, right? And you should jiggle it so that you can fit in the maximum number of marbles. You know, you jiggle it, right? And then you jiggle it, and then you can't fit any more marbles in. I mean, that's it. That's all it holds up to the top of the jar. Now, instead of calling that a one quart jar. We'll call out 144 marble jar, okay? Now, you can measure in that jar 58 marbles. And you can measure in that jar 59 marbles, but you can't measure 58 and a half marbles, right? You can only measure down to the nearest marble. Now, I'm just giving you the definition of digital in different language, right? It's the same definition. Substitute bit for marble, okay? 
So the idea is that the, what makes digital different from analog is that you have a certain minimum amount that you decide you're going to make your piece of information, your minimum piece of information, and everything goes down to that. And you just count numbers of those things. You got a question? Do you uh, repeat the yeah. uh, digital? Definition of digital? Digital is an incremental signal. It's measured in, in little increments, pieces, called bits. And you can only measure its accuracy down to the nearest bit. Okay, so the, the concept is clear. Remember what I told you when I was here so many weeks ago? That if, if, if anything's not clear, or even if everything is perfectly clear, and you just want to bug me, raise your hand and interrupt me and ask questions and stuff. You know, it's funny because if someone starts talking, people don't want to interrupt them. Well, I'll wait till he stops. You know, I don't stop too much. So what you have to do is just raise your hand up and start waving like this, you know, and I'll stop everything and, and he can interrupt me, okay? Because I don't want anything to go by somebody. That That's the worst thing. If one person sitting here, you know, just says, oh, I can't make it, you know, then uh, I'd rather have that person stop and bug me, okay? Right? We had a contract about that. Okay. Away we go. Now, this is our friend, the sine wave, right? Remember the sine wave? <laughs> they ought to have t-shirts that say, remember the sine wave. <laughs> like, remember the Alamo. <laughs> okay. Now, what type of signal is it? Huh? Analog. It's analog. It's an AC is right also. That's also a correct answer. Select one A, B, C, D, E. Okay. Now let's say we're going to make our, this is our, our bit. Now what this is, what's on this axis? Huh? What's on this axis? It's. Now what, what value is on the x-axis? Uh, that's a time. Okay. Time versus amplitude. Okay, right? It's the old time versus amplitude scale, right? There we are. Okay. Got it. Whenever you draw a graph, you should know what's on the x and y axis. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, it's time versus amplitude. Therefore, these bits are measurements of what? Time. Right. Okay, now, how can you measure time? With a clock. Because the first thing you do is you get a clock. And this clock goes tick, 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 tick right? Each tick is a tick. Here, tick, 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 tick. See? It's those little lines as a tick. Now, this clock just goes along and says tick, tick, tick. And each time the clock says tick, you measure your amplitudes. Okay, so you measure it there, measure it there, measure it there, 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 there. 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 it has got a negative amplitude here, so we have to go down. Okay, now, each time we the clock ticks, we measure. Clock says tick, measure, tick, measure, right? Okay, now each of these amplitudes has a value. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this analog signal, the sine wave, and we measure a certain number of ticks, and let's say we'll have to put a scale on this. Uh, it doesn't matter what this scale is. You could call these hundredths of a second or anything we want. But on this scale, we'll just put an arbitrary value of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so we can call this a 2. <laughs> We can call this a five. We can call this a six and a half. <laughs> but we can't do halves. We'll call this a six. We'll call this a seven. This is, you know, just a rough kind of thing here. This would be a, about a five again, and this would be about a three. Okay. So now we have a signal that instead of being analog, we have a series of numbers: two, five, six, seven, five, three. Right. The first value is a two. The second value is a five. Then a six. Then a seven. Then a five. Then a three. You do the same thing going down, right? Now, these are distinct numbers. If you were to take away this uh, curve, which is the sine wave, and draw something like this, this is our digital version of that sine wave. It's not a very exact reproduction, is it? No, it looks pretty lumpy, in fact. Uh, but you can see that it approximates what the sine wave was. Now, how could you make it be a more exact representation of the sine wave? Smaller bits, right? Suppose you made your bits real, real small, and instead of having one, two, three, four, five bits in this space, you had 5,000 bits in that space. Okay? Then you couldn't hardly tell the difference between the digital signal and the analog signal, could you? 
I mean, if you had 5,000 little measurements in that amount of space, right? Okay. We're just simplifying it. Computers can handle numbers. Great. That's the only thing they're good at. You can put a lot of numbers in. So computers are super for doing stuff like this because you can feed it 5,000 numbers and it just marks them up. You know, it's just a dumb machine. It just marks up the numbers. That's all it does. So, you know, computers aren't smart. They just, they just mark up numbers. In fact, they don't even know numbers. Uh, the only numbers they know are two numbers. Zero and one, right? They, they either know I'm on or I'm off. Right? <laughs> now I'm on, now I'm off. That's it. You know, it's like a switch. Computer's just like a switch. On and off, on and off. Real dumb. So what we have to do is we have to take these numbers and we have to translate them into computer language. Computer language is on and off. So we have to use a different number system. What number system is this? Decimal. 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 Number system to the base 10. Remember, oh, this is just like grade school. And we also had number system to the base 2. Remember counting to the base 2? Binary. Right. binary. Right, binary. Okay. So in the binary system, I'm going to take away half the sine wave. It's just like the other half. Okay. In the binary system, we have a series of columns, and each column has a value. And uh, we'll call them 1, 2, 4, 8. 16, 32, 64, okay, right? So you can take any number and convey it by filling in these columns with a one or a zero, an on or an off, right? So let's just say, this is our binary converter here. If you wanna take the number two, that's the number two, right? The number five is a four and a one, okay? So this would be on, off, on, off, 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 off. Right. Now I take the number 84, right? Take the number 84, you'd take 64 would be on, right? Plus, let's see, plus 16, right? That's uh that's 80, right? Plus four. Okay, so it'd be wait, well, these are ons here, always for on, you know. And it will blacken it for us. We'd have off, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, off, off. Okay, that's computer language. Off, on, off, off, on, off, off, off. On, you know, real simple stuff. Okay, now, <clears throat> you understand the process? We'll go over it real slowly now. Okay, now you take this signal and you convert it into offs and ons. Now, if you were to draw offs and ons on your little amplitude versus time graph, they look like this. On, off, on, off, off, on. Off, 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 on, on. That's two ons, twice as big. Off, okay? Now, if you translate this into, into binary, you'd have an on, an off, an on, an off, an off, an on, three offs, two ons, and an off, okay? This is called pulses, pulses. Pulses. They're little teeny, uh, square waves, right? Now, you understand how you get from here to here? Let's go over it again. First thing is, you have a signal, it's an analog signal, right? That's number one. Number two, you have a clock. And the clock says, tick, 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 <laughs> right? And then you have a circuit, circuit that says, take a sample. Sampling circuit, sampling circuit. Sampling circuit says, as soon as it, it just waits, and as soon as the clock says tick, it says sample, right? It's real dumb stuff, right? Clock just goes tick, 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 tick. Sampling circuit just goes, take a sample, take a sample, take a sample, right? <laughs> so you have a clock, you have a sampling circuit. Each time the clock ticks, you take a sample. And then you come up with this, which is your measurements of various, each of these is a certain number of, amount in, in digits, okay? Then you have something called an A to D converter, an analog to digital converter, A to D converter. This is the third circuit, right? You have a clock circuit, sampling circuit, and an A to D converter circuit. Now this A to D converter circuit simply takes numbers like this, which are decimal numbers, and converts them to computer language or pulses, which is binary numbers. Okay, so... Could you repeat that? Your, your A, to, A to D circuit, analog to digital converter, takes an analog signal like this, measures it with a clock, and then converts it into a binary format, which is a series of pulses. And what you get out is called PCM. This is pulse code modulation. 
Okay, now you know what pulse code modulation is. Pulse code modulation is a series of pulses that conveys the same information that's conveyed in this sine wave. How exactly is it conveyed? Depends on how fast your clock is. Well, why not make a super fast clock that samples a million times a second? Okay. Well, you can do that, but then it takes a lot of memory space to put all of the information in. So what you have to do is you have to compromise. You have to pick a sampling rate that's fast enough to get all the information you want to get out of the analog signal. Right? Not so slow that you degrade the signal, but not so fast that you need, you know, 14 miles of tape to record five minutes of music on, right? You got to need a happy medium there. So the sampling rate that's usually chosen is twice the top frequency that you want to record. So about 50,000 samples per second okay, is a typical sampling rate. They vary. They go maybe go up to 100,000 or 150,000. But for audio, about 50,000 samples per second is your standard visual sampling rate for audio signals. Okay. Does that mean your high end kind of? Well, let's say your high end is 25,000 cycles. That's two samples per cycle, very small cycles. And when you're way up there, you know, you're in that type of harmonic range, that's super high harmonics, you know, what you're talking about, of high notes. You're, you don't need that kind of discrimination to have audible fidelity. Because if you have two pulses per, per cycle, which is what you have, if you have 25,000 as your high end, which is real high, that's enough to give you quality information at that frequency. Of course, if you're measuring 500 cycles, right? If you're measuring 500 cycles, you have 500 pulses per cycle. So right in the middle of the audio range, you have incredible fidelity. You have a tremendous number of pulses to measure per cycle. Okay. This gives you a signal which is audibly cannot be distinguished from an analog signal, this type of sampling rate. You simply can't tell the difference. Yeah. What happened to the uh, system where you used one to nine and a zero? You were using like one, three. You mean decimal numbers? <laughs> no, on the... Uh, this here? No, the binary system. I thought it ran on like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, because they're the only numbers that you ever need, and it's just combinations of those. No, that's the decimal system. No, that works on the other way as well, wouldn't it, before, when they were using computers or images. Oh, in the early days of computers, they had analog computers, and then they had digital computers came after the analog computers. Now, analog computers had scales that read out in decimal system, but all computers operate on binary system because the memories of computers, there's different types of memories, you know? Yeah. The type of memory that's usually used for audio is tape memory. It's recorded on tape. Now, instead of having a whole bunch of different signals on your tape, you only have two signals, an on or an off. It's either there's a pulse or there isn't a pulse. And because they're just pulses, you can put them real close together, right? Real close together. You can get a lot of information in a small space. So you use binary system, which is simply pulse or no pulse, and your, col your number columns go in multiples of two, counting to the base two. So you have to convert your decimal numbers to binary numbers. That's why you use an A to D converter. It converts your analog signal uh, to a digital signal. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question so far? This is a lot of information in a short time. We're going to go back and sort it out more. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, it's the same thing on an analog tape. In other words, when you record on a regular tape in the studio, you know, on a regular analog tape machine, a lot of different frequencies and harmonics are all going on there at the same time. It's not like you can just record one sine wave across the record head gap of the record head. All those complex signals and waveforms are interacting, they're all recorded as a composite signal. Well, it's the same thing as digital. It takes all those composite signals and it digitizes all of them at the same time and records them all on the tape at the same time. Okay, so those numbers are not just simple numbers conveying one particular frequency. They're numbers that convey all the combination and complex combinations of frequencies at that particular time. Okay, it's the same idea as digital recording in terms of how it goes on the tape. Okay, now the, the difference is, here are some of the basic differences. Obviously, your order of accuracy in terms of repetition, okay, is very high. Let's go back to the, the jar with the marbles, right? 
If you measure out 16.4876 ounces of water, and then you pour it into another cup and check your measurement, you can't reproduce that measurement because a little water sticks to the cup and stuff, and you can't get that exact measurement, right? But if you measure out 58 marbles, you can just keep measuring out 58 marbles over and over again, and you'll have no error. Error goes down to zero, right? There's no error because you quantitized, right? Okay, unless you lose all your marbles. <laughs> okay. So this system eliminates errors in the signal because all, you have to, all the machine has to know is whether there's a pulse or there's not a pulse. So what that eliminates, first of all, is signal to noise problems. You have no more noise. Why do you have no more noise? Here's why. I'm gonna erase all this stuff. There's too much stuff on here anyway. We'll make it real, next drawing is gonna be real simple. Here's a PCM signal. Okay. Now, let's say your noise level is, is, is like this. Okay, this is your noise level. This is noise, right? All you do is you have a threshold, which you set on your circuit. And the threshold says, anything below this, I will ignore. Okay? What have you just done? You've completely eliminated all the noise, right? The computer doesn't care. All it cares is, am I on? Am I on? <laughs> it's got enough to know whether it's on or off. So it doesn't care about all the garbage. You can just take all the garbage and toss it. Tape, hiss, hum, noise, everything. Gone, right? We're talking about signal to noise ratios in the order of like 100 dB, 150 dB. Okay, they're basically signal to noise ratios as good as music or better. Because you, know, you can set a threshold and the computer says, just rejects anything below that amplitude and says, that's noise. Okay? Because this type of signal is like a, you know, a half a volt signal. So it's very simple. It can just say either it's there or it's not there. Anything below that is noise. Forget it. Right? Nice, huh? Real nice. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about how... Do you, does everyone understand this idea of how you convert it all into digital? Now you've got a series of pulses. They're very fast pulses. If you were to listen to a digital tape, <clears throat> I mean, take a digital tape and play it back, audio, all you'd hear is, this, you know, like, like your satellites, telemetry. You hear that, you know, that, that Sputnik sound? You know, that's all you'd hear. You don't hear any music. By the way, you know, the next big thing that the audio industry is going to come out with uh, in a year or two to make, I'll we'll get you in a second, to make a lot of money off everybody. Of course, the next thing is AM stereo, right? I mean, you know, by now the FCC has approved it. By next year, everybody's got to have an AM stereo in their car. And you can see all these ads and discounters and everything to get them. You can throw away your old radio and buy a new radio and all that. So the next thing they're going to do is they're going to bring out digital tapes to the home. See, they'll have digital, you'll need a digital cassette player to play your digital cassettes, right? Sure. So everybody's going to start making digital cassette players and be able to buy digital cassettes in the store. <clears throat> you know, and they'll go, <clears throat> keep playing them on your machine you have now. But if you play them on a digital machine, you'll get great music with a lot of signal to noise ratio. View sounds beautiful and great dynamic range. Yeah. That's how they make money. No pulses, you know, where you draw that threshold line. What is actually happening at that point? Oh, where it's, it's the threshold line. Oh, all, you, all the circuit is saying is this. Okay. But the idea of the threshold is this. You have an, this is your amplitude, okay? And your voltage goes up. And let's say you have a, a rising voltage. This voltage, this is one volt and this is zero volts. You can pick a point anywhere between one and zero volts where you tell the computer, as soon as it comes above this level, you recognize it. And if it goes below this level, ignore it. That's called a threshold circuit, okay? So let's say your signal pulses are half a volt. There are your signal pulses, right? You tell this thing to have a cutoff point, 0.4 volts. Tell it to have a cutoff point. You tell the computer. So anything below 0.4 volts, it, it won't register. If it gets a signal like that, a noise spike, it says nothing is there. So if it goes above that, it says, ah, a pulse, I'm on. Okay? You understand? So this idea of a threshold circuit is that you may have noise down here, you may have noise up here, you may have something that even looks like a pulse in there, but it's noise. It'll just ignore it. Because all your pulses are of a uniform height. Okay? Can't you get any kind of music that you might want? Now you're thinking analog. The, the analog signal has been converted to digital. All we have is pulses. The pulses are the music. Okay, so at that top point, that's where it sits. Yeah. The pulse. Well, the whole pulse is the pulse. Let me put it this way. When you were a kid, did you ever play with secret codes? You know, and you write notes to your friends and transpose all the letters and everything, and nobody could read it. 
if you had a little thing and say E is F and F is U and everything, you figure it out, right? This is just like a cone, see? It's a bunch of little dots, little pulses that go beep, 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 beep. It's a code, a secret code. And in that is the music. And if you can decode it, get all the music back again. Just like translating a code. So the music is not down here. This is not music. The pulses are the music in code. Got it? Yeah. Hey. Okay. That's it. Now, this is a very universal code. You know, it's binary code. Anybody can decode it. It's not secret. But it's the same idea. Okay. Now, how do you record the stuff on the tape and get it back again? What's the process of recording digital, digital recording? Well, there's two different kinds of digital machines. There's what's called the fixed head machine and the rotating head machine. The type of machine that you have for like video is the rotating head machine. The, the head, you know, normally on a tape recorder, the head just sits there. It's bolted down has two screws on top to adjust the azimuth, right? Well, in a video machine, you have a, a rotor, you know, like in your distributor. And at each end of the rotor, the rotor's got two ends. This is this is top, top view looking down. Okay. At each end of this is a head. Some of them have just one head, but let's use this as an example, two heads. And this thing spins around, spins around, looking down from the top. It's much smaller than that. Spins around, and the tape runs by here, and this thing is actually skewed. Side view. <laughs> okay, side views like this have exaggerated. So this thing, as it sweeps, it actually sweeps in an arc. Okay, you understand? Now, tape runs by the end of the head, and if you look at the tape, front view, The music is normally music is recorded on, a, on an analog tape like this, right? This is the way the music's recorded. You ever get one of those little things that allows you to look at the music on the tape? How many people have seen that? That's oh, far out. Yeah, that's great. I just love that thing. It's, a, it's great because you know, you look at tape and it's nothing but brown ribbon, right? Just a brown ribbon. I mean, you could have, you could have rock and roll on there. You could have disco on there. You could have classical on there. You can't tell. You can't run up to your ear and go like that. <laughs> You know, like, it's not like film, you can look at it and see pictures, you know? It's just a brown ribbon. That's why if you ever edit, you know, you edit tape, cut out pieces, and you stick them up. And which one was that, right? Stick <laughs> <laughs> it back in, you know? Well, if you actually hey, make this little disc, it's like a little disc with a viewer inside. It's got little magnetic particles floating in some goo. And you put it over the tape and you wiggle it, and it makes little lines, and you can actually see the stuff, music on the tape. And if you look at analog tape, it looks like little lines vertically like that, because that's the way the record head gap goes across the tape, right? Not so video. Video looks like this. It's recorded helically. This is what's called helical scan. Helical scan. If the head goes around, the tape goes by the head while it's going around. Pretty complicated. In fact, in videotape recorders they use professionally in TV studios, the head mechanism is suspended on a compressed air bearing, so there's no surfaces that actually touch. And when you turn the machine on, you hear the head start, and it goes it's like that, you know? And then it's like the thing is spinning with compressed air. You have to have an air supply to run it. On home tape recorders, they actually use little bearings. Some of them use a magnetic bearing. Some of them use a jewel bearing or something like that, but the head actually spins around. Well, why go to all that trouble? Well, remember, what you want is you want information density. You want to pack a lot of data, a lot of ons and offs into the smallest space. So if you stack them up like this, you get a real good use of the tape in terms of time versus frequency. You don't have to run your tape real fast or real slow. You can run at a good speed and you can sweep across the tape like this. Now, the only problem is that this signal records up to here and then the next part of the signal begins over here because this one was the other end of the head, right? So it actually, this is one, then it, be, then it goes here, then it goes here, and then you have in between the other parts of the signal. So if you were to try to play this back linearly, it would just be a total hodgepodge. You have to have some way when you play it back of syncing up the head with the tape so that when it goes back, you pick up exactly what you recorded, right? So it's not that simple a system. 
but it's actually less expensive to manufacture this type of system than it is to manufacture the fixed head type of video system. How you know where you are on the tape is another issue which we're going to take up next, okay? Okay, the other type of system is a fixed head system, and the fixed head system records in a linear manner the way your regular audio head does, like this, except you've got pulse information on the tape rather than audio information on the tape. And the tape, you can pack a lot of pulses in a small space. In fact, you can make your head gap very, very small because you don't need a lot of hunk on the tape, right? I mean, the only reason to make your head gap big Right, so you get a lot of hunk on the tape so you can have some space between the pole pieces so you can magnetize more area. You, understand, you learned about tape recorders. I see some blank looks. <laughs> the way he tape recorder heads are designed, right? How do you design gap widths? It's frequency response versus amplitude, right? The wider your gap, the more hunk you can get on the tape. The narrower the gap, the higher frequency you can reproduce or record. So that's why the record head gap is a little wider than the playback head gap. Right? Because on a playback head, you're not interested in recording a lot of hunk on the tape. You're simply interested in playing back the best frequency response. But on the record head, you want to load that tape right up to its saturation point with a clean signal. So you sacrifice a little high-end response, make your gap a little bigger so you can get more magnetic field onto the tape. Capiche? Okay. So with a digital system, you're not at all interested in level because all you want to do is just record a reachable signal on the tape. So therefore, you can make a very, very, very tiny head gap, and you can pack a lot of information into, into the space on the tape. You with me? OK. <clears throat> now, what's the advantage of these different systems? The advantage of the rotating head system is that right now in 1980, in September, August, or we are, it's cheaper. That's why we have one here. Okay, because you can go out and buy a video tape recorder at Sarge for Dean Columbus for $370, you know, like a Quasar or something. They've come down in price by half in, in, in like a year, you know. That's pretty cheap. And you can get one of those PCM units, you can say, hey, we got digital. But if you really want to be flexible in your digital format, which means you can do editing, and you can do other fun things, which we'll talk about in a minute, you really want to go with a fixed head system. And the system of the future is the fixed head system. And although they're going to sell a lot of rotating head systems now because they're about a third cheaper, the fixed head system is the one that's going to take over the field because it's a lot more flexible system. For one thing, you can edit the tape. You can actually edit it with a razor blade. And you don't have to worry about getting pops or clicks on the tape or anything like that because it ignores those. All it knows is what it's looking for. It discriminates a pulse. Right? If the thing is higher than half a volt, like a pop, it ignores it. Lower than four tenths of a volt, it ignores it. So it only picks up the pulses. So you're not, you can't be concerned with noise. But you can also edit digitally recorded tape in another way, which is really fun. And that's called electronic editing. Anybody here ever worked in, a, in like a TV newsroom? Okay, and you know about electronic editing, right? This is really cool. The guys go out with their rapid cams, you know, and they come back with video on these little cassettes, these three quarter inch cassettes. And, uh, they have an editing table in the newsroom and they edit up the stories for news time. What they do is they plug in a couple of cassettes, different footage, right? And then they got a little thing in the middle and they just punch in numbers and it goes to that point on the tape and it goes to that point on the other tape. And then you have a third tape machine you're recording both these things onto and you just hit a button and say, take from this number to that number and put it on this tape and hit a button. And it records that much on the other tape and then stops. And then you say, now take a piece from this tape and put it on that tape and you hit a button and it puts it on the other tape. And so that's called assembling. That's an assemble edit. You can take pieces and you can just assemble them electronically. You can do the same thing with music. Imagine you're in the studio, right? You've just done a digital mix, right? And the producer says, well, Gary, I like the horns from bar 40 to bar 47, but the drums at bar 50 were no good. And from the other take, I like the drums at, at, at bar 50. And uh, the horn intro was really good in that, in that first take, right? You say, no problem, man. You punch up your numbers, right? You put the thing into assembled mode. It goes, it puts all the little pieces together. And you say, now listen to that mix, right? And you've just taken pieces from all those different mixes and assembled them together onto another tape and played them back. All electronically. You don't have to cut anything. Now that's convenient, right? All right. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about electronic editing in a minute. Now, another fun thing you can do is, uh, you know, if you've done editing with a razor blade, you know how you take the two reels in your hands? And you want to find just where that word starts that you want to cut out, you know, right? And you roll the tape back and forth and it goes, 
<laughs> and then you cut it, right? Well, you mark it with a little grease pencil. You've done that. You've done that. Okay. Now, just because the people who design this digital equipment design it for people like us, you know, who work with knobs and don't know about digital. I mean, we all have grown up in regular studios with analog tape machines that we like to roll the reels back and forth. They invented this digital editor, which has actually got a little knob in the middle. You put your finger in and turn it back and forth. And what it does is it digitally memorizes. It has a digital memory in it. It digitally memorizes a few seconds each way from your edit point in the solid state memory. And when you run this little dial back and forth, it goes just as if you were editing a regular tape. And then when you find your edit point, you just hit a button. And it edits electronically at that point. You haven't really been listening to anything except a solid state memory of what was on your digital tape transposed back into audio and memorized. They, they do that just to make it seem familiar, you know. <laughs> and that cool Sony makes that. Okay. Now. Okay, I'm going to talk. Next thing I'm going to talk about is automated consoles and how they interface and uh, automated mix down and all that. I don't know, as we. Keep going on this digital thing. Does anyone have any questions about digital recording? The yeah, things you should understand are one, you can edit. Two, it has a great dynamic range, really good dynamic range, over 100 dB. It has really good signal to noise ratio, over 100 dB at best. The signal cannot be degraded. You can run 20 generations. You can run a dub and another dub and another dub and another dub, and the 20th dub will sound exactly like the original. Exactly, because there's no noise. Okay? So there's no degradation of signal. You can do 20 mix downs. You can mix down 24 tracks, right, into four tracks and mix them down again and again and mix them down again and again and have no noise, right? Far out. That's why everybody's gonna be digital in a few years. I mean, it's quite obvious. It's already started. Most of the big studios, you know, Westlake and Capital and our sales and are recording digitally now. The thing is you go out and buy a record or something at the record store, you know, and it says digital. Yeah. A lot of those, our master tapes that were recorded the regular way. And then what they did was they took that and they made a digital master from it, see? So it's not really a digital recording. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If it's a real digital recording, it's recorded digitally right from the mics in digital form. But see, because what they did was they had all these masters sitting around, they said, hey, digital, man, people will pay to hear that. So they just made digital masters from these already recorded multi-track tapes and then now you will get a little better signal to noise ratio on your final product. And you will get a little better transient response and a little better dynamic range, but not anything like something that's been totally digitally recorded from the first step. And you can get records that are totally digital, but a lot of the records that say digital are not totally digital. And if you read the fine print, they're just digital masters. It'll say digitally mastered. Now, most people don't know what that means. They say, it is digitally mastered, you know? Well, all that means is they took an existing tape they already had and just dubbed it digitally onto a digital machine. Okay, a little. Caveat emptor. So, let's talk about automated mix down. Uh, this is a big thing. It's fact, it's really, really convenient. And the way it works is this. There's two types of automated mix downs. There's a static and dynamic. Make it real simple. And everybody here knows what it's like to do a mix down, right? Everybody here has done some mixing down. Okay, so you already have a head start in understanding this. I couldn't have given this lecture three weeks ago. No way. <laughs> Involved in the mix down is you have multiple tracks recorded on your multi-track tape. And each of those tracks comes back on its own fader, right? And what you do is you adjust your levels throughout the mix. And maybe at one point you have a mute button, right? Let's say you want to get rid of the horns during the verse, right? You just hit that button and the horns disappear. And when you want them back during the chorus, you hit that button and they come back at the same level for your chorus, right? Or whatever it is, I'm using that as an example. And you have EQ, right? And you have some reverb and stuff like that. But basically what you're doing is you're assembling the final product from a series of pieces that hopefully were recorded nice and clean and clear and just the way you wanted them the first time. So you could take those nice pieces and put them together and make a nice product out of them. Now, what an automated mix down does is this. Just the description of what it's like to mix down on an automated console. You play back your multi-track tape <clears throat> and you do a mix, just the way you normally would. Now anybody who's mixed for a long time trying to get a song just right will understand what I'm saying. I mean, you stay up till three o'clock in the morning, you know, and you're mixing and you're mixing and all you look up and it's 3 a.m. and you say, man, we still haven't gotten it, you know, and you're getting a little wasted and you, you know, you think, God, you know, finally the sun's coming up, you know, and you say, that sounds pretty good, you know. 
finally got it. You know, then you crash out and you wake up about 11 o'clock the next day and you put that tape on. You say, God, that sounds like shit. You're going to start all over again, right? <laughs> well, the process is a lengthy one to get a good mix down. And you have to be sharp to do a good mix. You can't just mix for hours and hours and hours and expect it to be that good. You have to, you can mix for about four hours or something. And you got to quit and come back to it. Get some perspective. You know what I mean? So what automated mix down does is this. You do your mix, right? And then you sit back and you punch the thing onto auto. <clears throat> and what it does is it plays back your mix for you, just the way you mixed it. But you didn't actually dub it onto another tape. All you did was play, play it back to your monitor. You didn't record it onto the other tape. You just played your multi-track tape back through the board. Now, what happens? In the board are a bunch of little sensors in the board, which I'll tell you about. The sense is exactly where you've put the fader and when you and how you've moved the fader and when you push the mute button, right? And how you've set everything. And it memorizes all that. And when you punch it on the auto mode, all those faders move by themselves, just the way you move them. And the buttons go and everything all by themselves, just like a player piano, right? And it plays back your mix for you, just the way you did it. Now, let's say you don't like one particular thing in the mix. You're listening to the mix you just did, right? And the board is doing it for you, right? You hit it, you put the thing in what's called update mode. Okay, update mode. And all you do is you grab a hold of the fader of the thing you don't like and you move it manually, right? And it substitutes the new thing you've done for what was there before. Now you can run the tape back and listen to it again with what you changed. And you can keep changing it, and it remembers everything you did before and substitutes anything you touch and change. That's called update mode. So you can update your mix. You don't have to go back and remember what you did before. Let's say you've got the strings just the way you wanted them. Well, that's it. They're there. For okay. What this is, is a marriage between a console and a computer. Okay, here's the console. Here's the console. And here's the computer. And they're connected together. Connection is called an interface. Okay, interface. Now, the computer has something attached to it called a memory. 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 And they have different kinds of memories. And what determines whether it's a static system or a dynamic system is what kind of memory it has. Are you with me? Everybody awake? Hey. Hey. Now, a static system uses a memory that is separate from anything else in the studio. It's just the memory. It may be a cassette. You know, here I have one of those little uh, home computers, like an Apple or something, or a, what is, what's the Radio Shack, what are they called? TRS-80, right? And have cassette memories, you know? And, or you can use what's called floppy disk. Floppy disk. Sounds great, I love that floppy disk. Anyway. <laughs> You have floppy disk. Most of them are cassette or floppy disk. And uh, it's a separate little memory. You have a floppy disk playback unit. You know, floppy disks are those things they used to use in dictating machines in the old days, remember? Right? And it, some of them have, have a band in them, and some of them have a disk in them. That's what it is. You know, cassettes were originally developed for dictating machines. Did you know that? The Philips Company in Holland, yeah, in 1957, they invented this thing called a cassette. You know, and what it was for is for office desk machines. So they took out a patent on it, you know, and it was used in little dictating machines. So you can dictate a letter to your secretary and all that, right? Little did they know. Long came in the 60s and somebody said, hey, we've got the technology now to put audio on this thing that sounds good. And Philips has a patent on the design of the cassette. And every cassette that's made, they get royalties. Hey, that was some good stock to buy if we'd only known back in the 50s, right? So all cassettes are licensed by Philips Corporation and the design and the standards are set by Philips Corporation over in Holland. Huh? Compact cassette. Philips Compact Cassette. That's their logo, right? It's, yeah. it's on every cassette you can buy. Yeah. It's on every it's cassette. The logo. Yeah. <laughs> two, if you could go back in time, man, the two stocks you'd buy, right, would be Philips, right? And who else? Earl Dolby, right? <laughs> Dolby, he was ahead of his time. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so this is your, your static memory system. Your dynamic memory system actually records the computer memory signal on the multi-track tape itself, on your two-inch tape while you're recording. How do you do that? Well, you use, since you don't need much space, you can just use the edge of the tape. You can use one of the guard bands, or you can use a track. And usually they use a, a track, which means you have one less track to work with. If you have a 24-track machine, one track is used for of console digital encode and the other 23 tracks are available for audio so you sacrifice a track now the disadvantage of that is that your information is on your master tape now that could be an advantage because 
you know when you pull that master that uh, mix that that master multi-track master out you've got the mix information for that right with it okay in the other system you've got to go find the cassette or the plus disc that corresponds to that recording so you've got the mix but the advantages of the static system are it's much more flexible because you don't have to actually wind your master tape back to change things and stuff like that everything is on its own separate little thing and plus you have that track available for audio naturally the static system is a little more expensive now the way the thing works is this inside the console inside the faders there are little things connected to the fader called VCAs the voltage controlled amplifier VCA. VCAs are the keys to what makes automated mix down possible. Now, what a VCA is, is this. What's that? Three it's an amplifier, right? Pre amplifier, post amplifier, any kind of amplifier. It's an amplifier. I never figured out why they drew amplifiers like this. It's backwards. An amplifier should, be, should look like this. Actually, the input, and then it gets bigger without the other end, doesn't it? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Who invented all these symbols? It's strange, you know, it made them backwards. I mean, they must have had a reason. I don't know what the reason was. Huh? Is anyone yeah, else? So somebody would ask the question, why didn't they? No, but they must have been thinking of something. <laughs> Maybe they were backwards. Huh? Maybe they were backwards. Maybe they were backwards. Maybe it's slow. Signal flow. Signal, flow. Maybe. signal flow is this way. Okay, yes. hey, amplifier? I don't know. Anyway, that's the schematic symbol for an amplifier. If anyone knows, enlighten me. I don't know. Okay, that's the symbol for an amplifier. Now, a voltage controlled amplifier has two inputs. And this input is called a control input. Now, the way this amplifier works is you have a control voltage which ranges from 0 to 10 volts DC. And as you feed that voltage in, that determines the amplifier gain. In other words, as your control voltage goes up, the amplifier has more gain. As your control voltage goes down, the amplifier has less gain. Concept clear? Questions? Okay. This gives you some interesting possibilities because what you can do is, that, let's say you have a series of 20 positions of each half a volt, right? You have half zero, and then you have half a volt, and you have one volt, and you have one and a half volt, et cetera, et cetera, 20 voltage values, each differing by half a volt. And let's say as you run your fader up and down on the board, it creates a control voltage of 0 to, to 10 volts. And each increment of half a volt is fed out. Now that makes sense to the computer. The computer, computer can measure each of these voltages and tell whether it's got half a volt or one volt, right? It has distinct increments. Computers love distinct increments. So you have now a control voltage, and that control voltage can be fed to the computer, and it can be generated through a VCA. It can generate a signal, which the computer can remember, so the computer can know where you put the fader, right? Now, you can use the output of this amplifier, or, or another amplifier, to drive a little motor that moves the fader up and down. And you just feed the control voltage back out of the computer, right, and feed it back, and then the output of the amplifier is used to drive the fader. The other way around, the amplifier generates a control voltage that goes to the computer, so it works both ways. And that VCA acts as the interface between the fader and the computer. Do you understand the concept? Let me give you another example of how a VCA is used, so you get the picture. A synthesizer keyboard. <coughs> synthesizer. 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 Has a keyboard. Keyboard, synthesizer, keyboard. Each key on the keyboard generates a control voltage. So let's say you have two octaves on the keyboard. Let's say you have four octaves on the keyboard. It doesn't matter. You take your control voltage of 0 to 10 volts and you divide it by the number of keys you have. Okay? And then each key generates a control voltage up from 1 to 10 volts. And that's how the computer knows what key you've hit. Because that key has a, a certain voltage that it generates when you hit it. And that goes, now how do you change the, your keyboard, on the, your pitch on the keyboard? Some the synthesizers have a little knob you can slide. It moves the whole keyboard up and down so you can tune it. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? All it does is it just takes that voltage point and moves it for all the keys. See? Now, what about how, how can you generate different tones for each key? Well, you have what's called a VCO, a voltage-controlled oscillator. And that voltage controlled oscillator, for each voltage it gets, it generates a different frequency. It's an oscillator that's controlled by a control voltage. So the way you make that keyboard generate notes, is you hook up a voltage controlled oscillator, and when you hit one key, it says 1.44 volts. 
Boop, that's that note, right? And this oscillator will generate a whole range of notes depending on what key you hit. Okay, so VCO, VCA just gives you a, a voltage out which can then be fed into your synthesizer which can program a whole bunch of different functions you want to use. Computer interface. Okay, so that's how the thing works. Now, most of the mix down systems we have nowadays don't use, don't allow you to encode anything except beta position and mutes. You don't encode your reverb and you don't encode your um, EQ, usually. There are systems where you can encode them, but they're much more expensive and you don't really need them anyway. Why don't you need them? Because when you're doing a mix, you don't normally mix your reverb, right? Fiddle with your reverb. Oh, the reverb was good on the horns here and I'll change the reverb here. I mean, you know, you pretty much set the reverb. The reverb is not what's going to make or break your mix. You can always go back and do reverb, right? So you don't, you're not so concerned. Reverb's not as critical, so why use a whole bunch more bits of space on your tape to remember reverb when it's not that important? And the same thing with EQ. Normally you EQ each instrument or each voice so you get it the way you want it to sound, and then you leave it like that, unless you're going for some special effect, like at one point in the song you want to boost to 10K and then turn it down, right? But that's something you can do manually anyway. So normally EQ and reverb don't go on the computer memory, just fader position and mutes, because the fader positions and the mutes are the most critical thing in your mix. Right? Okay. So some of these systems have a little television screen. And the television screen is how you talk to the computer. Now don't let it face you, you know, that these things have computers in them and you don't know how to work with computers. Let's say you walk into a studio that's got digital. Most of these computers, I mean, they're just as dumb as we are. So what they do is they tell you what to do. The computer, you punch, turn the thing on and the computer tells you what to feed into its little keyboard. Are you are you mixing down? Yes, I'm mixing down. <laughs> How many tracks are you mixing down? 24, okay? See? Yeah, it just tells you step by step what to what to write. And you punch it out on a little, like those things at the library to find your books, you know? Or you, yeah, you have those, one of those systems at the library at school. They got one of those. You go in to find the book, you know, and you punch in the author and the title and hit a button, and the thing prints up all, where the book is. Anybody here ever used a computer? How many people have used a computer? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Man, kids today are far out. You know, kids today are totally in computer consciousness. You ever seen these little kids, you know, six, seven-year-old kids? They're totally in computer consciousness, huh? I bet they computer games. Yeah, they little computer, little computer games, and everything's little computers, you know, and go to school and get a little computer and figure everything out, you know? Kids are getting born now, skinny your fingers. <laughs> but it's true, because, I mean, like, my generation, when we grew up, we were the TV generation, you know? Everything zap, zap, you know? We grew up with TV, and, and TV was, was our education. You know, our heroes were Mighty Mouse, you know? all that stuff. So, do they remember Mighty Mouse? Yeah. yeah. Why never Mr. Trouble comes around? It's funny. But anyway, <laughs> but the kids nowadays, you know, they're all into rocket ships and, and computers and everything. It's all beep, beep, boop, 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 right? Computer language. On and off. Now on, now on. R2D2. That's, that's what the kids know nowadays. So, these kids are going to be very far out because they're already interfaced. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they already know how to talk to computers. So that's where the future is. If you want to know where the future is, look at the kids. That's where the future is, right? Okay. So in this mixdown system, if you walk into a studio that's digital, digital audio mixdown, you don't have to be phased by it. It's definitely a handy thing to have. You can always flip the thing on a manual and mix manually, you know. But if you want to use it on, on digital, especially most computer programs will walk you through it step by step. It'll tell you how many tracks you're mixing down. And the reason it wants to know how many tracks is because it wants to know how many faders to remember. Now, why does it want to know that? Because it takes a certain number of bits to remember the position of each fader. So let's say you've only used 12 tracks out of 24 for a particular mix, right? You tell the computer you're only using 12 tracks. Well, that allows you to get twice as much information in, in the space because otherwise it's going to record the positions of the faders you're not using, right? Which will take up space on the tape. Okay, now, we come to the question of how does the computer know where you are on the tape? Okay, and the answer to that is, you have something called time code. And it's called SMPTE time code. Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers standardized time code. This is the same time code that's used in the film industry. It's used in the film industry, it's used in television, and now it's being used in audio. All it is, is a, it's, you pick a certain point where you start your tape, and it just starts counting. It just counts numbers at a certain speed, and it records those numbers along the edge of the tape. 
That way, if you want to get, let's say you, you, you're at a certain point in the tape and you want to do a punch in, right? You're digital, you want to do a punch in. You, you listen to the tape and you find the point where the error was. You want to make your punch in. And right at that point, you stop the tape and you read out the LED readout and it says 4762, right? It gives you your SMPT time code for that particular spot on the tape. So you tell the thing, you program the little thing, you say, punch in at such and such a time. You punch in 4732, right? And then what, when you play the tape back, you don't have to hit any buttons. You don't have to punch in manually. It will automatically switch over to live mic at that point. And when you want it to switch back, right, let's say you, you found the beat, the beat where you can switch back in silence, right, where the pick is up or the person's inhaling. You know, you learn how to do that, right? Uh, you, you program the number, that in, and you put the thing in the edit mode, and it automatically does your punch in for you. You just sit back there and listen, right? And it automatically switches over to live mic and then switches back to tape all by itself. You don't have to hit the button and worry if you got it right or not. It's all pre-programmed. And if the person in the studio blows it, you just say, no problem, do it again. Roll the tape back, hit it again, it'll do the same thing over again. It'll keep doing it until it's right. Okay. So the SMPT time code tells the thing where you are on the tape. Now, you know all these, uh, what do they call them? You know the things that you roll the tape back and forth with, the remote controls to the tape? They have all different kinds of names. But the for these multiple, what are they different? Okay, okay. Huh? Auto locator. Auto locator at MCI and uh, 3M, they all have different names for them. These auto locator type things, they work off an SMPT time code. They actually record a time code on the tape, but they don't use any of your audio tracks because you don't need much space to record a time code. You record it in a guard band. You only need a little bit of tape. So they record a time code on the tape, and then you could punch up a number and the thing will go right to that point on the tape every time. And if you take that tape off the machine, stick it on the shelf and put it back, and hit that same number, it'll go right back to that same point on the tape. And if you can just queue it up the same, because it's actually reading a number that's on the tape. Okay. Same thing as on videotape. Because without that, you can't edit. You can't know where you are on the tape electronically to, to do something. So the thing always knows where it is on the tape. And it uses a motion picture time reference in terms of frames. You know, motion pictures are 24 frames per second. So a frame is a 30th of a second. So your SMPT time code divides you into half frames, which are 60ths of a second. So you can get your time down to within a 60th of a second, which is, uh, uh, what, uh, six milliseconds? 60th 60, 60 of a second, one sixtieth of a second. A second is a thousand, thousand milliseconds, right? So it's uh, 10 milliseconds. You can get yourself down to 10 milliseconds on the tape. Now, remember, you can only hear, how, how far can you hear repeated sounds? Did you learn that? Did somebody here teach you about echo? 15, 24. You're guessing. You're not, you're not, you're not guessing. 20, 20, 20 to 40? Yeah. yeah, that's good. He's right. About 30 milliseconds you can distinguish between repeated sounds. So if you have an accuracy of 10 milliseconds on your tape, you can't even tell. You, you're, you've got a factor of 300% error for your edit point. It's great, no problem. But of course, you know, it depends on who you are. Like you said, some people can hear it closer than others. It's just the law of averages. Okay, does anyone have any questions about automated mix down? This is one of those lectures where, I mean, it's just a whole slew of stuff in an hour and a half, you know. I mean, to go over, to go over digital recording, automated mix down, digital delay, all this digital stuff in an hour and a half is an awful lot of material. You know, it's far out. You just hung in here and listened to all this stuff, you know. It's not that easy. So, I mean, does this feel kind of like it's a hodgepodge to you, or is it making sense? How many people think it's not making sense? Say, I mean, be honest. It's a problem. You don't understand something. Tell me. That many people think it's making sense? Far out. Okay. That's great. Okay. Well, we can talk a little bit about... Uh, when, when you talked about reverb and compression and limiting, you know, I assume you talked about a lot. EQ, outboard equipment. Right. Did you learn about how digital delay works? Some people say yes, some people say no, some people say... Yeah. Kinda. How many people feel that you don't really know how digital delay works? No, let me put the other around. How many people really know how digital delay works? Oh, one person, two people. Okay, let's talk about it. Those people can go to sleep. I'll wake you up in a minute. Digital device. Oh, I just had a weekend. It's been bright and cheery. They always put me on a Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Digital delay is a system where you actually have a memory. You have a memory. Now, there's different types of computer memories. We talked about memory on tape. And now in these big computers, they have uh, super-cooled memories, you know? 
and they have bubble <laughs> memories and all kinds of solid state memories. Well, the type of memory that's normally used in a recording studio is your standard chip memory, you know? So chip memory. And you have what's called an IC, an integrated circuit, right? And it's got a bunch of little silicon chips on a little thing with a lot of little pins on it. It looks like a little bug. And uh, oh, it does. And uh, that type of memory usually is called a, it's called a RAM. RAM, a random access memory. What that means is once it's programmed, you can get at anything you've put in there. You have random access. You don't have to read it sequentially. In other words, you don't have to start at the first piece of information and read through all pieces of information to find the one you want. You can go in in the middle and get whatever you need. That's why it's called random access memory. Okay, concept is clear? They also have what's called a, a ROM. Yeah, I learned this digital language, RAMs and ROMs. ROM is a, anyone know what a ROM is? What's a ROM? Read only. Read only memory. And what that means is it's a memory that you can't program. It's pre programmed when it's built at the factory. Whatever they want to put in there, they put in there. And then every time you tell it to read, it gives you back what's in there. It says, right? And you hit read again, it goes, that always tells you the same thing back. You know, you have calculators which have constant functions in them, like Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion or degrees to radians, things like that. Those are all on little ROMs. Those conversion factors are programmed in on a ROM. When you hit that key, the ROM plays back. It's it's a little thing that it's memorized, okay? But you use RAMs to record the numbers that you're feeding it off the keyboard, right? Because each time you can program it and then you erase it. But the ROMs don't get erased. Even when you turn the battery off, they still remember their information. They're programmed at the factory. They're built with the information built into them. They, they laser cut them right into the silicon. Okay? okay, so these chip memories. Now, if you look inside a digital delay unit, what you'll find is you'll find a whole bunch of chips whole bunch of ICs all sitting there like little bugs. And uh, good digital delays and you have 100 ICs in them because you need a lot of memory. Because to remember music, music is a complex function. When you digitize it, you have a lot of bits of information. To remember one second of music, one second of music, you need maybe 2 million bits of information just to remember one second of music. You, know, so you need a lot of I see in there to remember music. Music is a complex, you were saying before that music is a complex waveform, right? So it's got a lot of information in it. So you need a lot of bits to remember it accurately. Okay. That's why they've just come out in the last year with fully digital uh, reverb. <laughs> because, you know, they used to have digital reverb. When digital reverb was first invented, the digital reverb units were about this big off the floor. And uh, the one that Neumann, Neumann makes a digital, digital reverb unit. You know, EMT, Neumann, a German company. They make a digital reverb unit, and it, it looks like something out of the, the Nautilus, you know, Captain Nemo. It's got these big knobs on the top, and the thing's got cooling fans in it, and it's got thousands of ICs on big printed circuit cards. The thing will actually remember five minutes of music. That's It's got that much memory in it. It'll remember five minutes of music. It's tremendous, biggest memory they ever put into it. It's very expensive. It costs, you know, $40,000, $50,000 just for a reverb unit. You can do anything. You can create all kinds of special effects with it. It's a fancy thing. It looks like R2-D2. But... Anyway, now the normal type of digital delay you find now fits in a rack. You know, it's on a rack panel. It just fits in. And it can only remember maybe a second of music. Well, that's all it needs to remember. Because remember, the most, or maybe two seconds of music, the most delay you want is maybe fit, you have 15 milliseconds, milliseconds, or 30 milliseconds, or 60, or maybe 100, or 120. Most of them don't go up more than 120, which is just a little over a tenth of a second right in terms of delay time but to get that type of delay it has to actually memorize the music that's coming in and then it has to play back that music 30 or 40 or 50 seconds later you have to be able to read out the memory so you program your memory and you read it back you have what's called a sample and hold circuit a sample and hold circuit the signal comes in there's a little clock that goes tick 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 and each time it ticks it takes a sample right and instead of just taking that sample and recording it takes that sample and it holds it for how long? Well, it depends on what button you push. Let's say 30 milliseconds. Samples and it holds for 30 milliseconds. And then at 30 milliseconds, it gives it back again, right? So it gives you a delay for a certain period of time. And it's completely electronic. It's just a solid state memory. And it has a hold circuit in it that allows it to memorize a certain amount of music. And it's constantly erasing the music as it gets to the end of its memory capability. It just erases and takes new stuff coming in. How many people have played with the harmonizer? 
play by. It's fun, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They show you how to create create harmonies with it. They just made funny noises. <laughs> ah. You can actually create harmonies with it. Didn't you think you could? That's pretty disillusioning to think you couldn't. Well, you can, but you have to be cool with the thing because otherwise it sounds like outer space. You don't make those funny noises. But it has numbers in the middle that you can dial up, you know, those little red LED numbers. And what those numbers are multipliers. And what they do is they multiply the input times a certain number. So if you feed in the note A, right? Oh, you feed it A. And then the thing multiplies it by whatever number you have in the window. Multiplies the frequency. So it multiplies, if you have 1.1 in the window and you feed in 440 cycles, right? It multiplies it by 1.1. It gives you out, you know, 444 cycles, right? So if you want to transpose something up a major third, you have to know that a major third is like 1.23 times your original frequency. You have to have a little conversion scale so you know what it is. Now, if you dial that up in the window, it'll take every note that comes in the input, transpose it up a major third, and play it back to the output a major third higher. So you can actually write a simple melody line that will harmonize in thirds, right, and play it or sing it into that machine, and it'll create a harmony line for it, okay? You can actually do that. You should try that. It's fun. Of course, if you just try to do that with any old thing you've recorded, what happens is when the thing modulates into a key where the it's not proper harmony, the thing doesn't know that. It just multiplies. You know, it just I'm on, I'm off. It just multiplies by 1.23, so you, you'll be out of tune. You, your, your harmony won't be right. So if you write for the harmonizer, I mean, certain passages will sound good when you put, you know, like you can record a tape and then you can play with it by playing back through the harmonizer and trying to see which parts harmonize and you can make up little fun things. I did a song where it just so happened that all the choruses had a, a horn line that came out harmonizing perfectly in thirds. So it was like doubling and harmonizing on the horns. You could do that through the harmonizer. It sounded nice. And even the vocal you could do. But during the verses, if you left it on, it would sound all out of tune. So you just punch the harmonizer in during the choruses and punch it out during the verses and those harmonies come out in your mix, even though they're not on your master tape. So you can use that harmonizer to create some uh, real musical effects, so you have to use it very judiciously. You had a question? No. Yeah. No. Okay. We have, there's another fun thing you can do with the harmonizer, which is tempo and pitch change. You learn about that? No, didn't learn about that. If the heads don't shake right away, I know. Or they'll nod right away, I know the answer is no. This is very interesting. Suppose if you ever do work for radio and TV, if you're in the recording business, you'll do work for radio and TV. You record a spot, you know, it's supposed to be 60 seconds for the radio. And then you edit the thing and you play it back and you find out it runs 63 seconds. But all your musicians have gone, right? And there you are with a 63 second spot. Now what happens if you send a 63 second spot to the radio station? All right, you lose the last three seconds. Just in a second. And now call 4-3. Your sponsor will love that. So what you can do is you can actually take a piece of music or a spot or anything else, and you can actually make it shorter. In other words, make it increase its tempo without changing the pitch. That's very useful. Conversely, you can take a piece of music and change the pitch without changing the tempo. How do you do that? Well, here's how you do that. You take the harmonizer, and the harmonizer has a VCO connected to it. Ah. And the VCO drives an amplifier, and the amplifier drives the capstan of the tape player. It's a 110 volt output amplifier, right? So normally your capstan runs on a 60 cycle line voltage. So if you vary the frequency of the line voltage going to driving the motor on your tape recorder, the speed of the tape will change, right? So you set the harmonizer to transpose up a major third, right? And at the same time, you or to transpose down a major third, let's say. And then at the same time, you, the machine speeds the tape up exactly the right amount to correspond for that pitch change. So that it comes out at the same pitch, but what have you done? You speeded up the tape. So the tempo changes without changing the pitch. Oh. Okay, you're using an output on the harmonizer, a VCO output on the harmonizer, to drive the capstan of the tape recorder so that as you change the pitch of the tape, you're changing the speed of the tape recorder exactly opposite to compensate. So if you increase the pitch, right, it slows the tape recorder down the exact same amount because, you know, if you slow the tape down, the pitch goes down and the tempo, right? But in this case, since you've already compensated for the pitch, it comes out at the same pitch and just the tempo changes. See? 
Now, conversely, you can take the whole tape and play it back through the harmonizer and change the pitch without changing the tempo. They also make a mechanical device that does that. It uses a rotating head, and what it does is it just chops little pieces out of the tape. It takes the whole tape and chops it up, let's say, into you know, 20,000 20, times a second, and then it eliminates every third thing, every third bit, just drops it. Now, you can't hear those small amounts of bits, but they add up to one third of the length of the piece of music. So if you don't chop too much, it doesn't, it doesn't sound funny. You can actually shorten or lengthen a piece of music by several seconds and make it fit exactly the slot you want without changing the pitch. Neat. It's a lifesaver sometimes. It's fed you a lot of money and all. So, and you know, one of the tricks that a lot of people use when they're mastering is to take a, <coughs> I don't know if you must have done this. You're recording somebody in the studio, let's say, and they can't hit a certain note. Is it a note they just can't hit, you know? So you say, okay, take five, you know, go have iced tea or something, come on back. And they still can't hit the note. Right? <laughs> so what do you do? Slow the tape down. Slow your multi-track tape down. Now it's at a slower tempo and it's a lower pitch and they can hit the note, right? And then you just play it back to the regular speed. <laughs> Nobody will know. Yeah. You gotta <laughs> smell how much to slow the tape down, right? Yeah, see how high they can go. Slow it down that much. Let's say they're just flat by a half tone, right? You slow the tape down a half tone. Slow it down so you can hear that it's a half tone flat, right? Then they hit that note, then you play the tape back at the regular speed, and nobody knows they didn't see. You just do a regular punch in, and nobody knows they didn't sing it at the proper pitch. Sometimes you hear somebody play a riff on the guitar, and you think, God, that guy's fast, you know? And then you hear him in concert, and he's not quite that fast. <laughs> now you know why. One of the tricks of the trade, right? So very simple. You slow the tape down and play that riff and then play it back at regular speed. Man, sound fantastic. So another thing people do is take your master tape and simply speed the whole tape up a little bit when you master it. Ever had a record that when you played it at home, you couldn't get it to correlate to any proper pitch? You had to tune your guitar different? Or if you were playing with a piano, it just wasn't in tune? It was like a quarter note off or something, or just some funny amount of, or maybe a half note off? Because what they do is they speed up the tape so that it sounds more exciting. Right? It increases a little bit of the pitch, a little bit of the tempo, but the, the pitch isn't exactly right. So that's just little tricks of the trade people do sometimes to make the music more exciting. You, know, you can experiment with it. Nobody ever talks about it. <laughs> it's just something people do. <laughs> well, I will let save the last uh, few minutes for questions. I think we pretty much covered a lot of ground today, and I don't want to wrap at you for any more time. A lot of information, you know, in a short time. So if you have any questions from what you've been doing the past three weeks, or from what you've read in the book, or from any of the lectures, including somebody else's. Go ahead. What is the difference between a voltage control oscillator and a voltage control amplifier? Okay. What is the difference between an oscillator and an amplifier? I'm asking you. An amplifier would amplify an oscillator would measure, right? No, an oscillator creates um, a freq generates a frequency like a tone. You know, there's an oscillator built into the oh, spear console. Yeah. You know, you punch a button and it feeds a tone onto the tracks. So you can set levels. There is, isn't there? Studio man. Studio There's one on the sphere. Studio man. There's one on the sphere. Hey, an os an oscillator is something that creates a tone, generates an audio tone, and sometimes you can change the frequency by turning a little dial. Right? You can make it go woo, whoop, like that. An amplifier makes things louder. It amplifies. Okay. So a voltage controlled amplifier, you by feeding a control voltage in a separate voltage that has nothing to do with the signal. You can control how much you want it to amplify. Just like instead of a manual volume control, it's an electric volume control. The volume control is controlled by an electrical signal. Okay? And with an oscillator, instead of turning the dial to change the frequency, you feed in a control voltage, and it changes the frequency according to the control voltage. So it's an electronically controlled amplifier or electronically controlled oscillator. Yeah? Why can you get a better dynamic range on digital tape? Oh, well. <laughs> It's very simple. It just depends on the number of, bit, number of bits you want to use. Here's your audio signal. Okay, let's say your amplitude, let's say this is the maximum amplitude where the tape will clip, the tape will saturate, and you can't, this stuff here is distortion. Okay, it drives the tape into saturation. This is a clipped, clipped signal, right? Right. Now all you do when you digitize is you set the thing to measure, instead of just measuring up to here, you set the thing to measure up to there. You can measure anywhere. All it does is take a little more tape to record more bits. It doesn't care, because all it's all it's looking at is bits. In other words, you can't do that if you're taking an already recorded multi-track tape 
and then making a digital master from it. You won't get any more dynamic range. Maybe a, a little bit that you would have lost in the in the dub, but you're not going to get any big amount of dynamic range added to tape. Are you with me? Yes. But if you record directly from your mics through a digital converter, through a pulse cold modulator, you can set that pulse cold modulator to measure any amplitude you want. Just depends on how much information, how much space you want to take on your tape to record the information, right? So you can have essentially any dynamic range you want to have just by setting the thing to read any amplitude you want it to read. And so if your tape machine, let's say, has 6 dB of headroom, your PCM can have 20 dB of headroom, depending. See, what you what you give up is the amount of space in your memory. So if you, if you have a huge, let's say you want 200 dB dynamic range, you know, an infinite signal to noise ratio, well, you're not going to record, be able to record that much music on a certain amount of tape. So what you do is you compromise and you say, well, I want 100 dB signal to noise, right, or 90 dB signal to noise and I want uh, 120 dB dynamic range. And you set your machine for those cutoff points, and it fits that amount of information in that amount of space. You use that amount of tape to record your pulse code signal log. Because you can record anything you want. It's just you need more space because you need more bits, the more information, the more marbles, you know? You want more amplitude, you want to go from a quart bottle to a gallon bottle, you got to have more marbles. So those have to go somewhere, and you need a place, place to put them, and that's your memory, which on a digital recording is your tape. See, so you need more tape. You have to run the tape faster, or you have to uh, use, you know, uh, wider tape, or so you have to have more space to record the information in. See, so what they did was they made a compromise and they fixed certain limits, and that's how they found the dynamic range. Does that explain it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How does that affect the uh, record as far as the stylus contact and the reproduction through loudspeakers? If you've suddenly increased the dynamic. Oh, very, very good point. Records also have a limited dynamic range. Vinyl records with little needles in the groove. Okay. In other words, you can record so much groove excursion. You have a bottom end on records. Have you ever listened to a silent groove on a record? I, I, not one that had tape hiss on it. I mean, just a silent groove, like a spiral groove. Okay, and if you turn the volume all the way up, at a certain level, you start to hear all these little pops and clicks that weren't there before, and you hear little noises that, you know, little feedback noises and all kinds of noises. So you have a certain kind of bottom level that you can't go below. There is a noise level for disc recording that doesn't include tape hiss. It's just physical manifestation of the disc. Your maximum level is determined by how far your groove excursion can go. In stereo recording, they use what's called an XY system where the groove modulated in 45 degrees like this. You know, mono is like this, stereo is like the groove moves like this. So if you want to record the music louder, you move the grooves further apart. But the cutting head has a certain limited dynamic range too because it'll go into distortion if you try to make it cut too much dynamic range, okay? So let's say you're gonna cut a record that only has 10 minutes of music on an LP side. So you're gonna get the maximum dynamic range you can out of the disc medium. Or let's say maybe 15 minutes of music, whereas normally you can get 23, 24 minutes if you cram it in with variable pitch spacing on one LP side. So you sacrifice music time. You still are limited by what the cutter head can do. And the best Neumann cutter head still can't equal what a digital tape can equal. That's why they're gonna have digital home tape machines. So it's going to kill the record industry, you think? It's not going to kill the record industry. People have a big investment in records. There's still going to be records, but it's going to bring in a whole new thing. It's like when cassettes came in, it didn't kill records. People bought cassettes, too. People are going to buy home digital tape machines because people are, you know, people were buying a lot more fancy stuff that we couldn't buy 10 years ago, you know, inflation and everything. You know, people have a lot of money. They come out and buy stuff, and master charge and all that, right? That's where this whole business is going. So people are going to go out and they're going to buy all these new pieces of equipment, and they're going to have home digital tape players. Person, the only person that's suffered between the uh, cassettes and records is the artist, really. You mean in terms of royalties? Yeah, things like that, because of the uh, pirates and then all that. Yeah, well, you see the whole cassette, that's why there's a SAG strike. The whole cassette thing, the reason is the SAG strike. You know about the SAG strike, right? No, Screen, Actors Screen Actors Guild is on strike. They're not making any movies. All the actors and actresses are on strike. They're not making any movies, not making any TV shows. Why? Because the thing of the future is video cassettes and cable TV. And they don't get any royalties if somebody makes a cassette of a film they made. And they don't get any royalties if it's broadcast on digital, on uh, cable TV. See? So what they want to do is anytime their movie is shown, they want to get royalties. Otherwise, they get royalties when it runs in the theater, and then that's it. They don't get any more royalties. So their SAG is on strike to get royalties because the whole future of TV is going to be cable TV. And the whole future of, of TV is going to be home cassettes and that whole thing and flexibility. So they, they've seen, you know, they have some vision. They've seen into the future. They want to get new contracts for that reason. And yes, the artists do suffer, and there are going to be some changes because of that. 
But surely they'll, they'll never win that, will they? Because I think they will. not big business. Well, I think I think they will win because if they don't make movies, I mean, most of these guys have enough money to sit back for a while. I mean, you know, Muhammad Ali's doing Roach commercials on TV. You know, these guys made some big bucks doing stuff, and most of them have a little bit of a cushion. And they don't if they don't work for a few months, that's okay. But if they're not making any TV shows in the fall, what's going to happen? The TV shows they're going to all run reruns in the fall, right? And people are going to you know they're going to pretty much turn off the TV and say, yeah, heck with that. You know, maybe I'll learn how to read. You know, something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't want to discuss politics, but <laughs> any other questions? No. What's whistling? The alarm. Huh? The alarm's whistling fire. The alarm's whistling. Yeah. We're on fire. Okay. Present. Tell them about Increase the tempo. Tempo. You're talking about tempo and pitch change. Pick up. Does that actually? Uh, change the speed of the tape you know you're talking about how about i don't know what you're talking about i didn't catch it but about where there's something you want to have work stand. yeah there's two ways one what the thing does is it records the music and it takes a little piece out like let's say in one second of music it divides it into a hundred parts okay little or a thousand parts let's say one millisecond parts every tenth millisecond it drops out one little piece now you've made the whole piece of music one tenth shorter. So if you had a 60 second piece of music, it's now 54 seconds long, right? But you don't hear the missing pieces because they're too short. Your ear fills in the gaps. You know, your ear likes to average. Remember we talked about that? That's what it does. You don't notice the missing pieces. Now what happens with the harmonizer is the same thing. When it makes a pitch change, what it's actually doing is it's cutting little pieces out to make the pitch go up or to make the pitch go down, to bring your frequencies closer together, to make them faster, you see? So if you do it too much, it starts to sound funny. It sounds kind of computery. It has a funny kind of fluttery sound. <laughs> now you can experiment with the harmonizer and hear it. If you go too far, it sounds strange. It's called it's called glitch. Instead of the signal, you know, being like this, so that way it looks a little like this, you know. And you can hear it. It's what's called a glitch, where where the cut is, where the piece was dropped out. You can actually start to hear it if you cut too much out. So these things are limited. You can't take a one hour piece of music and make it play back in half an hour, you know, at, at twice the tempo. <laughs> I mean, that, you, that's too much. You can change a little bit. You can change a few seconds. You can change the pitch, maybe a, a third, third at most or a second, you know, a small amount. But you can't do drastic things with this. Is that clearer? Yeah. Okay. What else? Nothing else? Thank you all. Uh, you really have taken off. You're very sharp. You're really good. I've taught a lot of classes here. You caught on quick. Thank you.